Look at the people who are investing in their lives. Such a move of the Spirit during worship this morning, amen? Man, I was ready to skip and just go right to preaching. I was ready to go. So last week, how many of us enjoyed Pastor Rose last week? Amen. <laughs> Fantastic. The Bible says to give honor where honor is due, and honor is due. So we honor those who give and serve. But I was in the middle of a four-week, maybe five-week, maybe six-week now, I don't know, <laughs> message on prayer. So the first week we got together and we talked about the will of God and praying within that, the, the, the boundary or the guidelines of the will of God for your life. Week two, we kind of talked about what is a one-time prayer, praying in faith. And then what we do when we ring the bell over and over, over and over again, we're persistent in our prayers, we're persistent chasing after the things of God. Today, I'm going to talk about maybe the persuasion of prayer. If you have maybe a thought process with it, it would be persuasion. I'm going to try to tie all this all together and try to bring back a little bit to your memory. But I was sitting in Park and Puke. Anybody know what Park and Puke is? Oh, Eaton Park, excuse me, Eaton Park. <laughs> be kind, be kind. <laughs> So the only ones open on Wednesday. <laughs> we have no options. Oh, they're, they're fantastic people. I agree with you. Sweet Jesus moment. All right, here we go. So I'm sitting with my mother. My mother decides to remind me of one of my teenage days. Anybody ever sit with your mother and they remind you of a teenage day? Woo. So she takes me back to when I was in high school, only... A few years ago, right? right a few, I said amen a few years ago. Okay. So I just received my driver's license. <laughs> and uh, for me, being raised in a Christian home, it was more like maybe not freedom, but more like a jailbreak. Okay. <laughs> Driving in my house was like a jailbreak. No offense, Mom. I love you. You're fantastic. Okay? Go ahead, Mama. Raise your hand. This is my mama. I love my mama. That's my mama. <laughs> so, as most parents do, they trusted me with their vehicle to go someplace. <laughs> Fools that they were. So, <laughs> I go, I don't know. I don't even know where I was going. I went someplace, and I, I had this rule of thumb. I could be anywhere in five minutes. Okay? As I've gotten older and wiser, I can be anywhere in 15 minutes. So I go somewhere. I can't remember where I'm going. But I, it's time for me to come home. And curfew in my household was not something that you broke, right? So I can't remember where I was supposed to be. I had to be back. I think it was like a Saturday or something. And, and I'm trying to get somewhere in five minutes because I can do that. And I'm already 10 minutes late. You feel me? Ran across one of them Sunday drivers, and I decided, you know what? They're going slower than the speed limit. They have to be, right? So I should just pass them, right? Hmm. My mama, my mama, okay. So I, I decided to pass this slow Sunday driver. And as I hop into the other lane, I see a very familiar vehicle driving right at me. It was my mama. To my surprise, my parents were in the other lane coming right at Now, they make it out to sound like it was closer than it was. And it, listen, it wasn't that close. I've got the microphone, you don't. <coughs> but I was told it was closer than I thought it was. Getting around this car and seeing my parents driving at me. 
Now, I, well, I was a good boy. I went home, but apparently they decided to turn around and come home too. Right? I got this conversation. It kind of goes like this. What are you doing? You could kill yourself, right? You shouldn't be driving like that. Don't you know that's my vehicle? Right? Now, in their defense, they showed me mercy. It took me a few more times before I lost my license from them. But sometimes a good parent, a good father, what do they do? They warn you of things that are eminent, might have some eminent danger in our lives. And as parents, we kind of want to raise our kids to live to take a breath the next day, right? That's what they were doing. They were trying to instruct me. They were trying to warn me about my actions. They probably weren't good to do while I was driving in a vehicle. Right? Well, I'm going to take you, and I apologize, our, our, our PowerPoint's down today, but I'm going to take you to a time when God is warning Moses. And he's saying, listen, there's some issues here. There's this communication. We all need to understand that communication with God is this thing called. So we're going to go over a time when Moses and God were communicating. Now, who is Moses? Moses, he's a child of God, but he's a leader in the Old Testament. He's a co-laboring partner he's walking out the will of God in his life and you're going to see a conversation here which I think is fantastic you're going to see a conversation here between God and Moses we'll bring out some truth some spiritual truth right but I need to set the stage for you Moses has just led the Israelites out of Egypt they were in bondage they were in slavery like like me when I was at home and I was stuck without a car, bondage and slavery, right? <laughs> I'm going to get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> but these children of God, they were complainers. They were whiners. They're complaint. God parts the Red Sea for them and they're whining. They don't have what they want to eat and they're whining. These, now listen, I know this message is not for you because, listen, you guys aren't Christians that complain. I, I know that, right? You might have a hard time relating to this message. You guys don't complain, do you? You're not, we're not carnal Christians that let things bubble to the surface. That don't happen here. But if you were, you can use this to pass information on to people around you. How about that? Okay? So... Big Mo, Moses, right? Big Mo, he's on Mount Horab. And what's happening here is he got the Ten Commandments from God. Okay, so we're establishing covenant and promise. The Ten Commandments were covenant and promise between the Israelites and God. Moses is facilitating this. He's a great leader. The problem was the people didn't want to have a relationship with God. They didn't really want to pray and communicate. And we see this in Exodus 20, 19. This is what happens. So the people stood afar off. But Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. See, God's over here. This is old covenant. New covenant. Jesus is in our hearts. They didn't have that back then. They used a prophet to communicate. And then they said to Moses, these are the children of God, they say to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us. They didn't want a relationship. They didn't want to communicate. They didn't want to, uh, to, to have a prayer life. What did they, they wanted to complain. They wanted to grumble. And it's not very long after this, what happens is they make a golden calf. And they're saying, this is our God. We're going to pray to this thing. That, that blo 
blows my mind. It bl- he frees them from slavery. He plagued Egypt, set my people free. He led them with a cloud by day. He protected them with a fire. At night, he parts the Red Sea. And then he's so good, he creates a covenant. It says, if you do this, I will do this. If you do good things, I will bless you. He creates his covenant with his people. Now, what do these complaining carnal Christians do? They decide to make a golden calf and worship that when Moses is on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. You've got to be kidding me right now. You've got to be kidding me. So what we're going to see here is a conversation. We're going to see a conversation between Moses and God. Okay? And, and listen, my father, my father had three things he used to say to me. First thing he would say would be this. Cool it with the boom booms. Now, I don't know what the boom booms were, but I knew when he started with cool it with the boom booms, whatever I was doing, I had to stop. Now, <laughs> he used to use this word enough. Too. When, he, when he came to the second word, he was like, enough. Like, I knew I was one stage past boom booms. Okay? And then he would break out another language. Now, <laughs> my grandmother was, my great grandmother was German, spoken German. My dad picked up one word, comprendo or comprende. Okay? And when he would say, you comprendo, you know what that meant? You understand? I'm get, that, to me, that meant I'm getting beat. <laughs> like, like that's third strike, you're out. Right? He had one word foreign linguistic skills, I guess. Right? So we're going to pick up here in Exodus 32, <clears throat> 7 through 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. He's on top of the mountain. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Talking about the children of Israel. Verse 8. They turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, and brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is God. He's, he's upset. Can, can, can you feel this? The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and indeed they are a stick-necked people. They're a proud people. They're a people that don't understand their God. I've done all these things for them, yet... They choose not to worship me. Verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone. That my wrath may burn hot against them. And I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. What? Think about this conversation for a minute. God tells Moses, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the planet. And here's what we'll do, Big Mo. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a nation out of you. Because you're righteous. And you follow me. Mm. Now, do you think God was serious? Mm. (laughs) He's serious. I mean, would this upset you if this was your children? I've given you everything, kids. And look what you've done. Man, he was he was was he really gonna destroy the nation? Now I'm gonna tell you something. When my dad got to the comprendo stage, the threatening was just about over. Right? I don't even know how he said it. Wait, where's dad at? You guys need to start messaging him. I think he's stuck in Colorado forever. I really do. Yeah, he's got an avalanche, right? But guess what? When you say something to your kids, you got to follow it up. Or guess what? They're going to know. Yeah, he's fooling. Right? He's fooling. 
But the children of Israel did not honor God. But I, here's the reality, though. Most kids don't. I've got five. Sometimes in the teenage years, no offense, John, I love you. No offense, you know what I mean? In the teenage years, they kind of, me, 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 right? And they learn over time. They learn over time, but, I mean, God's God, don't you think? That he knows that his kids aren't going to appreciate him? It seems to me like there's a little bit more than just lack of appreciation, lack of love, and lack of worship. I mean, this is God. So what they didn't appreciate him? So what my kids don't appreciate me? Sometimes I got to get over it, right? Do you think this is the only reason that God is upset? Like, I really took a look at this passage, and I'm going, is this why he, well, my kids have done some dumb things to me? Like, if I had a dollar for every time my kid got angry with me, we could have bought this church debt free. Right? So I want to bring something to the forefront right now. I think there's a little bit more going on. Guy, you remember this guy by the name of Noah? Right? God says, I found one righteous man. And he had to flood the earth. Because he had to start over. There was so much wickedness and so much sin. There was only one righteous. And God had to start over. I want to make a point here. You guys remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's this fantastic conversation between Abraham and God. Maybe I should have went to that one first. Maybe we'll get that one next week. I don't know. That's a great, fantastic conversation between Abraham and God about Sodom and Gomorrah. But here's my point to you. About every couple hundred years, maybe half century or so, well, maybe more than half century, but every couple hundred years, guess what? God has to do something to slow wickedness on the earth. Why? Man is wicked, but he knows that. He knows his kids are dummies. Why? Why does this have to happen? So redemption could come. Stay with me. God's caught in his catch-22. Like, Jesus has to come to the earth so all of us could have relationship and salvation. The problem is we can't make, we can't stay right with God long enough to let that happen. And he has to keep starting over. So he starts over with Noah. He tells Abraham, I got to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. There ain't going to be any righteous person left on this earth that I can bring my son through. The reality is this. We had to have a virgin for him to be born to. Let's just start there. Secondly, we had to have some good parents who were willing to raise him in the things of God. Listen, Jesus had to go. He had to learn the word just like I have to learn the word. Do you think he was just born and knew it all? No, he spent time in the temple. He was taught. He had to have some good parents. And the reality is this. These pagans sacrificed their children to false gods. What? How can the Savior be born? If there's no one to take care of him, no one to teach him, no virgin to be born to. And we're going to see here in this conversation, this is God and Moses having a conversation about a redo. That's what I, I mean. This is Steveology right here. Take it or leave it. But this is what I feel is going on because I know I've got five kids. And as, and as proud as they can make you, the reality is that that's how much they can disappoint you. And you know that. You love them anyways, right? Well, at least you say you do, right? <laughs> Strike that. We got to edit that. 
But why after just a couple of generations did God's chosen people choose to walk away from the good God that freed them? I mean, don't you ever ask yourself this question? We watch story after story after story in the Old Testament, how they just walked away from God. After God did something miraculous for them. I mean, doesn't this bug you? I'm going to tell you something. I had a conversation with God about this. Why is this, Lord? I'm going to take you to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Their spirit was dead. When Jesus came, he quickened your spirit and made it alive. He quickened your spirit and made it alive. They didn't have the the advantage of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the advantage of Jesus as an example. They had the Spirit of God that would momentarily rest upon a leader and he would speak. Christ had to come for us to be born again. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, we went over this earlier in discipleship class. For God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. Our spirit becomes alive in Christ. But Christ had not come yet. No Jesus to show them the love, and to buy them back with His blood. No Holy Spirit of the indwelling. I'm going to tell you right now, every time I hear this verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved, so loved, ridiculous, radical love, that He loved the world. Guess what? My spirit leaps. Do you agree with me? They didn't have that. They didn't have that. We are so, our new covenant is so much better. So much better. So guess what? We probably would have made a calf too trying to figure out what's going on. Just throwing it out there. (laughs) So I fault them, but I don't fault them. They they, they just weren't alive. Hmm. Let's get back to the story. But, but Moses knew God was serious about creating this new nation, right? He was serious. And, and, and sometimes we think, like, this is not a God type of thing to do because he's all powerful, he's all present, and he's all knowing. I mean, God, you're just going to destroy these people, but you need to understand something. Jesus had to come. This was a real warning. Mm. So in this prayer, we're going to see, we're going to look at the conversation here, but we need to know know a few things. We got to know the prayer is powerful. And God and Moses, you're going to see here, God and Moses, they kind of get on the same page. Scripture tells us what? When two, come on, preach with me. Yes. Whatever you ask in, that's right. Amen. And I love this one here, James 5, 16. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Righteous man is powerful. Yet all my life, like, and I've started this prayer series because I'm going to tell you, I feel sometimes I pray and I pray and pray and I pray, nothing happens. Right? All my life, though, I'm told in church, prayer changes things. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, really? I, I know, I know. This message isn't for us because we don't think like that, right? I know. I, I hear you. I hear you. you. None of us thinks like this. It's for, it's for the church next door, maybe. Who knows? But 
we get these thoughts like God is God. God's just going to do what God's going to do. So it doesn't matter what I think or what I say or what I pray. Why bother? Mm. Let's reread verse 32, 10 here. Let's read this. He says, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them that I might destroy them, and I will make a great nation of you. And what is going to happen here? Moses, Big Mo, Big Mo is going to, going to say, hey, God, let's, let's, let's have a conversation about this. Let's have a little bit of prayer about this. Let's, let's think about this for a minute, God. And I'm just like, what? What? He's going to say this, but here, I want you, I want you to go back to verse 7. Let me read this to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people. Let's just stop right there for a minute. Your people. God said, Moses, your people. What's he saying to Moses? You're the leader. Mm, Maybe. When God made Big Mo the leader, he gave him not only the responsibility, but the right, the authority to speak into the situation. Now, this isn't like when the mother of my kids and me argue about your kids. Because she would tell me all the time, hey, get your kids They're acting like you. (laughs) And do something about them. And I would say, yeah, but they're your kids too. And I've been at work all day. You handle the situation. Right? Not that type of situation, though. So what do we know? Moses has a responsibility For the people, the Israelites intentionally worship someone else. But the reality is they have a dumb, dead spirit. So guess what? Even when these people were not doing like what they were supposed to do and not worshiping, God is not going to take away Moses' authority. He gave him the responsibility. He has a right to speak into the situation. This is a lesson we would do well to learn. Right? God called me to preach. He called me to pastor. So when it comes to mercy and action ministries, when I throw myself on my knees and I say, God, God, I'd love to see a big, beautiful building. You're sitting in it. You see what I'm saying? God, I want a powerful discipleship ministry. You're enrolled in it. Mm. Lord, we need a fantastic food ministry. You work in it. God, we want fantastic outreach into the community. We've got block parties. I have the authority Because I have the responsibility. Woo, that's good preaching right there. Good job, Pastor Steve. Yeah, thanks. Hmm? Even if you got to pat yourself. My wife tells me all the time, she says, you can't reach your back, can you? I said, no, I need you to pat it for me. (laughs) We need to understand this. We've all been given authority by Jesus. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says this, on this earth. Now, he says, go, therefore, make disciples. Go, make, teach. He says, you have the authority that I'm giving you. If you accept the responsibility, then you have the right. This is how prayers get answered very, very quickly. Hmm. Jesus says to this, he says, whatever you ask in my name, right? Whatever you believe and receive, 
whatever you wish. I've given you the responsibility and you have the authority. You have the permission to go before God and plead for what you want to see happen. But the reality is we got to stay within the confound, the boundaries of his will. Hmm. So let's talk about this thought process where we are persuading God. Because I think we get confused sometimes. We think we're persuading God. We think we're persuading. So let's, let's take a look at this for a minute. Let's go to verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. This and Big Mo is the symbol of mercy in the Old Testament. This is why he was such a fantastic leader. Because he always chose mercy. He always chose grace. He always chose, and that's why God chose him. Amen? Verse 12, why should the Egyptians speak and say, this is funny, he brought them out of harm to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from his harm to your people. Big Mo, he threw it back on God. He says, your people. <laughs> so they're having, a little, they're having a little back and forth here. God says, they're your people. Mo says, no, they're your people. Nobody's claiming them. <laughs> You know, what, what, what would the witness be to the Egyptians? Struck with the plagues to be free, part of the Red Sea, just for you to wipe them out and start over again. Doesn't look too good on you, God. I think that's what Moses is saying here. It's, it's not looking too good for you. Then he says this, and this I find this so cool too. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land I have spoken of, I will give to your descendants. And they shall inherit it forever. Moses is having a conversation. Listen, Moses having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the God that he loves. Let's just start with that. Remember the promise? How stupid would it look if you freedom just to smite them? But it'd be, it'd be silly, Lord. But listen, notice Moses, uh, Moses is, he's appealing to the reasons. Right? So guess what? He has the position of responsibility, yet he has the right to speak with authority as he prays within the confound of the will of God. We see in this dialogue, there's, there's, the heart is revealed here, right? Moses is, re don't you think God loves his people more than Moses does? He does. He does. And he knows Moses' heart. He knows. And I think when we get into prayer sometimes, really, What's happening? Are we persuading God? Or is God revealing his heart in this situation? I say B2. I say B too. You know, this was a test in school. It would be C, 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 C. Right? But I'm going to tell you right now, praying within the will of God, I would not ask for anything that would not glorify God, and I would not ask for anything outside of the will of God. In prayer, Christians have the permission to pray within His will. Mm, the authority of prayer. You know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite prayers go like, goes like this. You ready? Lord, if I have a vote, if I have a vote in this situation, this is what I would like to see happen. I leave it open. Because if something has to happen within his will, Jesus, our Savior, 
Garden of Gethsemane, slumped over the rock. He had to die. He's like, listen, is there any other way that we can, we can walk out your will without me getting beaten unrecognizable, crucified to a cross, beaten until the, the back muscles are shredded off of my body? Is there any other way? God's like, no, my son, there isn't. Not my will, but thy will be done. Sometimes there's just one road, right? But when we, <laughs> and, I, and, and listen, <laughs> I, I used to do this a little bit, and this, I, I, I'm not very proud of this, but I'm just going to pose this as a question. How many of us come into offense? Right? And the first thing that we do is we go before God and we start complaining about the situation, or worse, the person. Right? God, this woman you gave me. It started early in the garden, baby. Hey, not that woman. It's just woman in general, right? Yeah, sure, you're right. I'm going to save you right now. <laughs> I know, I can't save myself, but... <laughs> I'm going to hit you with an interesting thought process, and this, this, is, this, is, this is something that's off the message, but I want you to, who, first of all, who accuses the saints? The liar, right? Do you think he has free will access to heaven? No. He was cast down. So how do the saints get accused in heaven? Through the temple. So when I start praying and complaining to God about the creation to the creator who accuses the saints, the saints accuse the saints. That's how it happened. And, and, and God, <laughs> and listen, I, I, I've wrapped a lot of complaining in what I thought to be sincere prayer, okay? Now, I know you've never done that, right? You've never accused another servant before his master, have you? Mm. God's dealt with me about this. I, you are not going to drag me into accusing a fellow servant before his master. I will never do it again. Holy Spirit's been dealing with me. Lord, these people that you've given me. Not going to do it. He's too good. He's too kind. And when you do that, you curse. And you give Satan free access into heaven after God already threw him down and Smashed his face. And you just you just open you just open it back up to him. Somebody. Okay. So what happens when he end up in a situation? I'm gonna go you back to, to, to week one of this message. Jesus says this, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who who curse you, and pray for those. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Amen. Pray. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're extremely blessed, I think you're spitefully using me. Just throwing it out there. Because I am going to pray for you and pray for you. So you got some blessings. Hallelujah. Come on, that's kind of funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Let's pick up here in verse 30. The next day, Moses said to his people, you have committed a great sin. But now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses is speaking to the people. He's going to go before God, right? Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gold, gods of gold, excuse me, 32. But now, 
please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out with the book you have written. Woo, that's intense. Moses says, take me with them. If you're going to take them out, you take me too. Man, that's the captain going down with the ship, baby. Woo. Verse 33, the Lord replies to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I have spoken, and my angel will go before you. However, but, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. Now, God and Moses have this fantastic conversation. Lord, don't start over again. We've already had Noah. We've already had Sodom and Gomorrah. Please, we don't need to start over again. I'm going to go down with the ship. Save them. We don't need to do this. God says, okay, but guess what? They have sinned. Old, listen, the old covenant. You do good, you're blessed. You do bad, you're cursed. Old covenant. New covenant, I have grace, and I'm forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. But there had to be consequences. And I know discipline in the church. Oh, right. Oh, no. But the reality is this. Old covenant, there had to be punishment for sin. That was the law. Right? So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to call Mercy Music back up. Do you really think God is going to give you a responsibility without the right and authority to speak into that situation. 